Good morning. My name is Sarah Nelson, and I am the junior high director here at University Covenant Church. I have the pleasure of opening up God's word with you this morning, so will you pray with me before we begin? God, we thank you for your word, God, for all the little stories that make up your big story of how you are moving. God, as we open up your word today, I pray that you would open up our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. God, I pray that my words would be uh, yours, not my own. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I had the opportunity last week uh, to spend a lot of time at a lovely place called Frontier Ranch. Frontier Ranch is our denomination's camp in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and last week I got to be the speaker for fourth through sixth graders, many of our own church kids there. I love speaking at camp. It's so fun. I got to use lots of Disney clips, which is the best. Uh, But also, I love just getting to hang out with kids during the day. I spent a lot of time each day hanging out with kids, playing a game called Nine Square. I think we have a picture of it. There we go. Okay, this is an awesome game. And pretty much the way it works is you have your little square that you're standing in, and you attempt to volley a ball into someone else's square. And if you touch it twice, or if it falls, you're out. And your entire objective during nine square is to get to the middle square, the king or queen square, where you see that guy in the hat right there. Every day we'd play this game for like literally hours, <laughs> fourth through sixth graders. Uh, and one day we had been playing for quite a long time. And during that entire game, there had been one male counselor in the king or queen square. All of the students were like, we got to get this guy out. He's been there forever. But they're about this tall, and he's about this tall. So you can imagine what that was like. Finally, this kid, Andy, who's a very enthusiastic nine square player, about this tall, goes in. He's like, I'm going to do it. And so just at the right moment, when the counselor wasn't looking, he hits the ball, and it falls just in the corner of his square, getting the counselor out. The entire game erupted. Yes! This is the best! People were running circles around, just cheering, and they kept going, Andy, you're our hero! So excited about what he had done. This is how we often think about heroes. People who step in at just the right time and make just the right move to save the day. The story we're about to read today is definitely a story that is in need of a hero. We've been in the middle of a series called The Story, where we're reading through God's word together. And today we come to the story of Esther. This story takes place in the midst of the Persian Empire, one of the most powerful empires of the time. We have a picture of their rule at their height, going from modern Iran all the way to Egypt and lots of other places. And they ruled this way for over 200 years. During the time of Esther, uh, Persia was under the reign of King Xerxes. Pretty cool name. And our story takes place in Susa, one of the capitals of this great empire. There were many Jews that lived in Susa, but they were part of the Jewish diaspora, meaning they didn't live in the hub of Judaism, but that they had been wandered off in exile for quite a long time from their homeland and from their home religion. So they lived in an occupied land where they were a minority. And in many ways, they were removed from the history of their religion and their people. In fact, in the entire book of Esther, there is zero mention of God. No mention of Jewish customs or traditions, no prayers, nothing. Showing us that maybe this distance that the Jews had was not just physical, but also spiritual. Away from the heart of the God who had led them for so many years. For generations, God had been telling the Israelites to keep themselves set apart by practicing all of these traditions and customs. But in our story today, we find a group of Jews who are more or less blended into the culture around them. To help us understand better the full story before we dig into the specifics, let's watch this creative retelling from the story. Israelites left Babylon, many returning to Jerusalem, and some heading to surrounding countries. An Israelite named Mordecai moved to a country called Susa with his adopted daughter, Esther. While they were there, the king of Susa 
Xerxes was looking for a woman to become queen. Young women from all over Susa, including Esther, were brought to live in the king's palace and go through a year of beauty treatments before the king would make his selection. When Esther finally got to meet King Xerxes, he was attracted to her more than any of the other women. So Xerxes placed a crown on Esther's head and made her queen. But Esther did not tell him that she was an Israelite, also called a Jew, because Mordecai asked her not to, fearing his reaction. One day, Esther's father Mordecai was sitting near the king's gate and overheard two of the king's officers planning to kill the king. So he warned Esther, and Esther told King Xerxes. The king's life was saved, and the two men were executed. Shortly after, King Xerxes promoted one of his men, named Haman, to a position higher than all the other officials. He commanded everyone to bow down as Haman entered each day through the king's gate, but Mordecai refused. When Haman saw this, he was furious and even more angry when he found out from some of his officials that Mordecai was an Israelite. So he looked for a way to kill not only Mordecai, but all of the Israelites living in Susa. He convinced King Xerxes to declare a law, stating that all Israelites living in the region would be killed on a specific day because they would not follow the king's laws. When Mordecai heard about the law, he tore his clothing and wept bitterly. He convinced Esther to go before the king, reveal that she was an Israelite, and ask the king to spare her people. There was one problem. No one, not even the queen, was allowed to come before the king uninvited. If they did, they risked being put to death. But Esther was brave and approached the king who asked, what is your request? Esther said that she wished for the king to host a banquet and to make sure that Haman, the man who wanted to kill the Israelites, was there. At the banquet, she would make her request known. When the day of the banquet came, everyone, including Haman, was there. The king asked Esther what it was that she wanted. She revealed that she was an Israelite, a Jew, and begged for her own life and the lives of her people. The king was furious with Haman, who had convinced him to create the law and had him arrested and killed. Then King Xerxes not only removed the law to kill the Israelites, but gave all of them living in the region protection and rights. Because of Esther's bravery, the Israelites were spared and even honored. Got a sweet beat behind it. Um, so here we have the story of Esther, a story of a woman of incredible courage and beauty who acts in just the right way at just the right time to save all of God's people from genocide. I don't think we would be wrong by any means to call Esther a hero. She makes a huge power play at just the right time to save all of God's people. But many things happen in this story before Esther gets to this heroic moment. You see, after Esther has become queen, the king makes this man Haman, one of his top guys in all of the kingdom. And immediately, Haman uh, issues a decree that whenever he walks by, people are to bow in front of him as a sign of respect and recognition. Esther's adopted father Mordecai is standing one day at the gate where he's a gatekeeper. And sure enough, Haman goes by. Now I can imagine everyone bowed as Haman decreed that they would, except for Mordecai. Mordecai refuses to bow in front of him. Now this isn't just because Mordecai maybe doesn't like this guy Haman or thinks that he's kind of rude or whatever. It's actually because Haman is an Amalekite. He's not just any Amalekite. He's actually a descendant of an Amalekite king. And the Amalekites and the Israelites, they have a long history together. It goes all the way back to when Saul was king. And God ordered the Israelites to get rid of the Amalekites once and for all. Now Saul failed at this mission, which leads to the destruction of his reign. And so I can imagine that when Mordecai sees Haman walking by, he doesn't just see Haman, he sees an Amalekite. And this moment of tension is built up from generations and generations of ethnic tension. And so Mordecai refuses to bow down. And Haman responds to this, and Esther 3.5, he says this, 
When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Haman isn't content to just punish Mordecai, but he wants to get rid of all the Jews. To finish maybe what his ancestors had started generations prior, um, to get rid of these people that he had been warring with. And this starts the real crisis moment for the Jews in Persia. This is a time where we see there's definitely a hero needed in this story. So word begins to spread amongst all the Jews of what the plan is to get rid of them. And Mordecai, out of response, begins to wail outside of the king's wall. So loud that finally he gets the attention of Esther, his adopted daughter. And when he does, he begs her to stand up to the king on behalf of the Jews. But at first, Esther doesn't really show much hero power. She's not really interested in being a part of this plan at all, and she begins to give him excuses. She says things like, well, the king doesn't even know that I'm a Jew, because she had hidden her identity from him. And then she begins to explain to Mordecai, you don't understand, nobody is allowed to talk to the king. But Mordecai continues to push her, and he finally speaks his famous words to Esther, urging her to act on behalf of his people. In chapter 4, starting in verse 12, the story goes on. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not, think that, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai hints to Esther that this is her moment, to make a big move to be a hero. And when I read this, it reminded me that it's not all that different from many of the other biblical heroes that we've read about in the past. Imagine with me for a second, when I say the word biblical hero, who comes to your mind? I think of people like David, who killed Goliath with just one stone straight in the forehead. Or how Joseph saved his family in all of Egypt from a horrible famine. Or how Daniel stood up uh, to a lion and later became a key person to the king. And when I think of these people, I think of their big moments. The times they've, ju they've done just the right thing at the right time for such a time as this. And it makes me think that if they hadn't acted, disaster would have ensued completely. Can you imagine if there's no David or Joseph or Esther? But Mordecai's comment to Esther seems to kind of tear this apart. It makes me think the story isn't actually about heroes. In verse 14, he says this to her. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. He basically says to her, hey, if you don't do it, somebody else will. I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of hero stories, but that's not usually the way it goes. If you don't do it, somebody else will. Mordecai seems pretty confident that God's plan to save the Jews will continue whether or not Esther wants to participate in it. But he continues to push her forward. I wonder if Mordecai is not pushing Esther to be a hero, but rather just pushing her to be faithful to what God has put in front of her. As I read Mordecai's words to Esther, I begin to wonder if I've read all of these stories of biblical heroes wrong. Stories of Esther and David and Joseph and Daniel. That maybe these aren't stories about big heroes that make just the right move at the right time, but rather just ordinary people who make small, faithful decisions to follow God in whatever circumstance God has put them in. Like, what if these big hero moments were actually just made up of all these tiny, faithful responses to God? I think often we read these stories and we think, man, I wish God would work in my life like that. I wish that I could have the courage to face a lion like Daniel did, or the wisdom to know what to say to a king or someone in power um, like Joseph did. And we begin to think that the only time that God really uses us is in those big, epic moments or in crisis moments. That's the only time it really counts, your faith. But the story of Esther shows us something different. 
that our small, faithful choices to follow God matter tremendously. So here, Mordecai pushes Esther um, to respond faithfully. And watch what happens. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Here we see Esther making a choice to respond faithfully to what God has put in front of her. And I don't want us to overlook this, because the reality is that Esther has made a lot of unfaithful choices in the past. She's a Jewish woman who's married to a Gentile man, which is definitely against the laws of God. She doesn't follow any of the dietary restrictions or customs that the Jews were required to set them apart as God's people. But here in this moment, something shifts in her, and she makes just one faithful decision to say, yes, I will go to the king. I will imagine that just for a moment, maybe possibly, God might choose to use me. And so this is how the story unfolds, not from one heroic moment, but a series of small, faithful responses to God. So Esther says, I will go to the king. I think this is true of our faith as well, that our faith is not built up in huge moments where we get to prove it or in crises, but our faith is built on small, continual choices to respond faithfully to Christ every day. My faithfulness to Christ is built up and strengthened when I have the opportunity to show patience to someone that is very difficult for me, or kindness to someone who is not kind to me. These small, faithful choices matter to God. When I was in seminary, I had a favorite professor by the name of Michelle, and we all thought of Michelle as a very wise woman. And she said that even years after her students had left, they would call her asking her for advice. But the kind of advice they would ask her for would be advice for crisis situations. She said a lot of people would call her uh, years into a marriage when they hit a huge crisis. And they would say, Michelle, I just don't think my marriage is going to make it. Tell me what I can do in this moment. So she would try her best to give her faithful responses on how to respond then. But she made the point that nobody called her and said, hey, Michelle, um, do you think that I should do the dishes tonight for my spouse? Or do you think that I should uh, maybe choose to be kind when my spouse responded rudely to me? Or do you think that I should do something kind for them just for the sake of it? No. Nobody asked her about these small little decisions that we make every day. And our point is that relationships are built up not in the big moments, but actually in the tiny, small ones. The same thing is true with our faith, and the same thing is true here with the story of Esther. So as we unpack the rest of this story, I want to highlight just three ways that Esther responds faithfully to God. Esther's first faithful response that we'll look at is that of community. Immediately after Mordecai pleads with her, she says this, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights, and I and my attendants will do as you do. Here, Esther recognizes that she needs her community in order to continue to respond faithfully to what God has put in front of her. This is the first time in the entire book that we see any mention of a Jewish custom. But actually, fasting was something that the Jews used quite a lot in crisis situations to together as a community plead to God. So Esther makes a choice to involve her community. Fun fact, the word hero appears zero times in the New Testament. You know what appears instead? The word saint. Throughout all of the New Testament, God's people, you and me, ordinary people, are referred to as saints. In fact, this word is used 46 times in the New Testament. And every time it is used, it appears plural. The people of God are meant to be a community. And if we are to respond faithfully to what God has called us to, we have to do it together. So here we see Esther begging her community to come together and fast. Esther's second faithful response is one of patience. Now I think if this is me and I felt all of a sudden like enlivened that God had called me to something, I would go right away to the king and I'd be like, God's going to protect me, this is going to be great, I'm a Jew, you should save us. But Esther doesn't do that. 
Instead, she enacts an incredible amount of patience. It says, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, Esther replied, let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do as Esther asks. It's shocking to me that even after, the king, even after the king asks her, what is it you want, she still enacts an incredible amount of patience. She holds back so that she's able to be creative with what God has called her to. And in fact, she hosts two banquets. She goes through the entire first one and still doesn't reveal what her request is. Esther isn't wrapped up in the heat of the moment, but she actually puts on a characteristic of God's people, patience. Now, I don't know if in that moment Esther recalled that patience is actually something that God has called the Israelites to for generations and generations. Again and again in the story of her people, God has called the Israelites to wait and be patient. And in this moment, we see Esther putting on those characteristics. The same thing is true for us, that often God calls us to put on the characteristics of God's people. To be people who cult cultivate love and peace and joy and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. These are the characteristics of God's people, and these are always faithful responses to God. The last way that Esther responds faithfully is by improvising. As the story continues, Esther gets the king and Haman to come to another banquet. Now, I don't think at this point in the story that Esther knew exactly how this was going to play out. If it was me, I wouldn't have a lot of reassurance that this was going to go exactly how I wanted it to. But yet, Esther continues. And it says, so the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king asked again, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? The king answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant my life. This is my petition. Spare my people. This is my request. Now, I don't think in this moment that Esther had an exact playbook for how this was going to go. God didn't tell her, hey, Esther, you're going to go to the king, and you are going to reveal that you're a Jew, and he will have compassion on you, and the Jews will be saved. No, Esther improvises what she thinks a faithful response is and uses the gifts that God has given her in that moment to be faithful. Now, when I say improvise, I don't mean she just makes it up. Um, in acting, the act of improvising actually has rules. If you are going to improvise, one of the rules is that your improvisation has to continue to move the story forward. Meaning like the way that you're improvising has to make sense within the story you're in. That's what we see Esther doing here, calling upon who she knows God is and how God has gifted her and acting faithfully. She uses her own identity and God honors that and spares the Jews. I want to leave you guys just with one story. When I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to take a class called Wilderness and Faith. Uh, in this class, we studied a lot about wilderness and faith. <laughs> and then in the middle of it, we got to go on a four-day long canoe trip. Now, I'm not really a canoeer. I've never been canoeing before. So the first day of the class, they just put us on a lake and we learned like, different strokes and how that works. Uh, I learned like how to turn a little bit and kind of how to direct my canoe to go forward. And the next day we were out on the river. Day one goes awesome. I'm like, I am an expert canoeer. This is great. Day two comes around and after lunch they warned us, hey, there's going to be a series of rapids that you are going to have to go through. It's not really a big deal. Just if you see like water going this way, it's a rock. So don't go towards that and you'll be fine. So I was feeling a little nervous, and I was sitting in the back of the canoe directing which way it would go. And my friend Adam was in the front. So as we're choosing our path through the rapids, we see our professors in a canoe together, experienced canoers, uh, choosing a path. And we're like, we'll just follow them. That'll be great. So we go to follow them. We watch them enter the rapids and immediately hit a rock, capsize, and fall out of their canoe. 
This was a moment of sheer panic for me. I'm like, what do we do? So we choose another path. We somehow make it through the rapids. And we find ourselves in a moment of calm with four other canoes next to us, our friends. As we're trying to figure out what to do next, one of my friends, in a not-so-wise moment, decides we should just tie all of our canoes together. That is the best plan, then we'll be stable. So he does so, he ties five canoes together, uh, only to realize we're about to enter into another series of rapids. Uh, so we go through, slightly terrified, and almost right towards the end, I realize that me and the person on the other end are the only people who have any control over the direction of these canoes. Right as I realized that, I turned to see my, friend's Adam, my friend Adam's face in sheer horror as he yells, there's a rock. I look for it, and there's not just a rock, but what I would describe as like a large boulder, almost an island, like a six-foot rock right in front of us that our five canoes tied together are heading straight towards. Now, in this moment, I had no playbook for what I was supposed to do. No one ever told me, hey, when you are tied together, five canoes, and you're going through a series of rapids, and you're the only one who can control it, this is what you do. No. In that moment, I improvised faithfully with what I knew of canoeing. I remembered, hey, maybe I should stick my paddle in and pull back as hard as I can. It'll turn us. Sure enough, we turned just barely enough to miss the entire rock and get through the rapids. Now, I don't tell you that to say that I'm a really awesome canoeer, and you should think that. It's not true. Or that you should invite me on canoe trips. Probably also not true. Um, but I say that to say that there are many times in our lives where we face a situation where it's unclear what the script is to follow God. Maybe there's not a clear left or right, yes or no, wrong or right in that situation. And it's open in front of us, unscripted. And in those moments, God calls us, just like Esther, to faithfully improvise within the story of God. To use the gifts and abilities that God has given us in that circumstance to respond faithfully, even when there's not a clear command. The good news in following God and responding faithfully, as Esther did, is that God does not leave us alone in this journey. Before Jesus departs uh, the earth, he tells his disciples this, I will ask the Father and he will give you an advocate, another one to help you and be with you forever. God has given you and me the Holy Spirit who walks alongside of, alongside of us in all circumstances, the big crises and opportunities, but also the small moments where we get to choose to respond faithfully to God. I pray that we would be people that in any moment, mundane or exciting, would choose to move God's story forward by being faithful to what he has called us to, just like Esther. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for the story of Esther, for a woman of great courage who uh, makes a series of yeses to you. God, I pray that you would give us boldness and courage uh, to live like Esther in that way, that in the small everyday moments, God, you would show us how you want to use us, God, um, how you want us to respond to you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would guide us when we feel lost without a script. We're so grateful, God, for your guidance, for your friendship, for your wisdom. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.